my subject is basically on the rock. When I first, uh, I was dabbling with my girlfriend, uh, she took me to a concert. She told me it was a, a rock concert. But she didn't tell me the symbolic meaning of the rock, which is Jesus. So it was a Christian concert. So I was mad dogging the whole time. <laughs> but at the end of the service, I understood because what the pastor was saying uh, made sense to me. Though a lot of things didn't make sense to me at all. Not the voice of my mother, not the voice of Driven Hall, not the voice of the Marine Corps. Uh, the voice of the Holy Spirit was real, was tangible, was penetrating. And I stood there, just, actually, I, I was standing there, just convicted. I didn't even know what the word convicted meant. That's when you feel jacked up, tore up, and messed up. <laughs> and the truth hurts, like Roberta Flack's song, killing me softly with each song. And the word of God was killing me softly to the point where I basically capitulated. That's the word I learned after I became a Christian. That means I gave up and I surrendered completely and I went forward and I received the Lord Jesus Christ. Not seeing, not foreseeing, nothing, what God was going to do through me. And then my girlfriend that left me for Jesus became my, not my girlfriend because we're, we're not going to play like that. So I gave her a friendship ring. And then an engagement ring. And then a wedding ring. And then we got into the boxing ring. <laughs> That's not funny. Not funny. Then we have five kids. It became the circus ring. <laughs> but now that they're all grown, now we're in remembering. <laughs> we're at that stage now where Millie and I have become friends. I just want to let you know that I asked the pastors, how long you've been married, David? And David said 37. The other day, David said 31. And, and Victor said uh, 25. And combined with mine, 40, going on our 41 year, that's 133 years of married experience. So what, I, what I'm about to share with you is basically something that was assigned to me and when it's assigned to me, it's so wonderful because I don't have to resort to old manna because they said, do whatever you want. Well, that's easy for me because I can, I can get studies and just, just Frankenstein them and, and reform them. But when they give me an actual scripture, it says work around it. That's labor. That's work. <laughs> and what I'm going to share with you is something that I labor. But see, the more you labor, the more you know. So it's not so much to broadcast and dispense something to you. It's about me learning it first. And so I, I, I thank all the speakers that have gone here. I, I've learned lots. I've learned how to pray better. Lord, bless my wife and change me. Lord, have mercy. That's radical. That's revolutionary. I've been a Christian for a long time. I, I've never prayed like that in the name of Jesus. So I have to apologize to my wife, apologize to the Holy Spirit, apologize to my staff, and apologize to our entire church. I have never prayed like that. Oh, oh Lord, I'm already learning. I've entitled this message, Rock Your Marriage. <laughs> now, it's taken from the Sermon on the Mount. See, the, be the beginning and the conclusion of Sermon on the Mount is very interesting. You have to hear me out. In this, the Sermon on the Mount is one of the most, uh, uh, is one of the most explosive uh, literary in the whole world. I want you to know that that is the most read uh, portion of literature, scripture in the whole world, in the history of humanity. Very powerful. That's where Ch Jesus changed people. So Jesus did not come to change the law. But Jesus gave a fundamental change by interpreting the law without altering God's standard. Now it all begins, Matthew records it, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, ending in verses 7, uh, 7, 24 to 32. Now the beginning tells us that after the multitudes were gone, Jesus goes up to a mountain to pray. And then when the multitudes were gone, the multitudes is very interesting. In multitudes, you have the wannabes, the looky-loos, the weedy-weedy, 
these are the people who are not interested in the things of God. So the crowds dissipated. And Jesus went out to pray. And the Bible says that his disciples met him in the mountain. And when we think of disciples, do not think only the 12. We're talking about multitudes, those that were followers of Jesus Christ, those that had believed in Jesus Christ, those that were transformed by Jesus, and their worldview had been flipped around. You see, all of us have a worldview. Whether, you, whether you're a crackhead, whether you're in the White House, or in the crack house, you have a worldview. It is your belief system. And all of us have a belief system. Well, I believe. And that's, that is your worldview. My worldview was transformed when Jesus came into my life. I came into to a relationship thinking, I know how to handle this. I know how to act. I know what to do. I know what homeboy has to do. And that was my philosophy. It's a dog eat dog. Right. And that was my philosophy. It is messed up philosophy, but that was my philosophy. We, my philosophy is organic. God created it on Genesis. And it's like, it's like mint. It's like oregano. <laughs> Except you don't put it on your food. That was my philosophy. I hurt no one. It's better than intoxication. And plus, I get to eat afterwards. <laughs> that was a philosophy of mine. My philosophy was rock. My worldview was rock. These disciples, their worldview was rock. And they followed Jesus. So it wasn't until the multitudes dissipated, or they were gone, when Jesus begins now to share with them. Nothing new. But you see, the law... <laughs> this keeps turning off on me, man. I forgot. You have to keep playing. So if I see, if I see this, it's just to keep it on, all right? Now, Jesus just made a fundamental change by interpreting the law. You see, the Lord Jesus here explains more fully the true meaning of God's law. Because the common people were dependent upon the religious leaders to, to, to interpret the Bible, especially those who did not speak Hebrew. There were those that were reading now the, uh, the, the new Bible translated from the Hebrew into Greek. But still, there were very many illiterate people. There are many illiterate people in my community. They tell me over and over, Ponch, I want to read, but I, I don't know how to read. And that gets very emotional because that, that's me. I'm a graduate from the 60s in East L.A. East L.A. and those schools were just... Graduating people, even though they didn't even know learn math, English, is graduated. I was a 12th grader. You know what all my, my classes were? Auto shop, upholstery shop, wood shop, metal shop. <laughs> That's it. I like it. English? No, no English, eh? <laughs> so that was my frustration that I couldn't read. And when I became a Christian, that is one of my sincerest prayers. Lord, teach me to read English. <laughs> English. Help me to speak English. The Lord's, I can see the Lord saying, that's all you want? That's easy, man. Boom. And all of a sudden, desire came in to go to college, to go to school. And my surroundings were there with, with, with people from, from Cambodia, from Vietnam from China, from Taiwan. I'm in an East, East L.A. college, and there are no people from, from the community. They're, they're all Asians trying to speak English, and I'm with them. I'm saying, I'm a Vietnam veteran. I'm an American, and here I am. This is humiliating. But this is a prerequisite to get the next class, and then a prerequisite to the next class, and thus I went. The propellant, the excitement that made me go was the motivation of God, the strength of God, the ability to say, go for it, get your education. And I went for it. I, my worldview has been transformed. Jesus here begins now to transform people's life. They were all disciples. Jesus never spoke really to a husband or to a wife. Jesus spoke as David so eloquently expressed 
when Jesus speaks to us, he's not speaking about how to be a CEO, how to be a father, how to be a mother. Sure, there are little intimations here and there, but there's not a summation of how to be a father. How many of you here that are married did not go to premarital class? Raise your hand. Did not go to premarital class. Okay. How many here who have children went to parenting classes before you had children? One point. <laughs> we learn OJT. OJT is an acronym. We don't have it anymore. But OJT is what? On the job training. And so everything I know, everything I'm about to say to you, every content, every word that expressed out of my mouth, it's not my ideology. It's not my philosophy. It's not panchoism. It's only a rebroadcast of what God has broadcast into me. And it it's only a republication of God disclosing himself to me. After 40 years together, I've learned to understand my role as a husband. You see, the Pharisees, uh, they, were, uh, they were having this external theatrics. Uh, the fancy word, I like fancy words, is formalism. You look at the word formalism, it's exciting. Formalism is basically a theological religious word that means they're religious on the outside, but inside they're, they're, they're immorally rotten. And the Pharisees were such. You see, Jesus radicalized everything by that inclusion, but I say unto you. And as he speaks so mighty about lives and how to behave, what Jesus recommends in the book of, of, of in the Sermon of the Mount is totally unnatural for us. For example, see, if I share this scripture in my neighborhood, or I say the hood, it don't, it don't fly. When Jesus said, if someone strikes you, on the cheek, what does he say? Turn the other one. That don't work in my neighborhood. That doesn't work. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If you're angry, if your enemy is thirsty, give him drink. Not in my hood. It don't work that way. If someone forces you to walk a mile, walk two miles. It's impossible. Totally impossible. We can, we can surrender and lift up our hands. He says, enough. This is an insult. I cannot do it. But listen to what you're saying. I cannot do it. Jesus never told you to do anything alone. Jesus said, I'm with you. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I am the life. I will give you the ability, the empowerment. You're my disciple. I will give you the empowerment to think differently. To walk differently, to behave differently, to walk in love, to walk not as the Gentiles walk. I will teach you. I will guide you. I will modify you. I will transform you. I will do everything for you. All I need is your heart. That's all I need. Your heart needs to be pliable. Your heart needs to be malleable. Because people, when they have a hard heart, that's the problem when we have a hard heart. So Jesus after concluding the eloquent sermon on the mount, he finishes the, 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 the sermon in Matthew. Would you go there? Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7, beginning with verse 24, he says, Therefore, this is the conclusion, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rains descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it fell, and great was his fall. In the name of Jesus, Lord, bless this study. The conclusion in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus presented two options to the listeners because now they were responsible for what they heard from Jesus Christ.
the figure in the parable, you have two builders. One is a hearer and the other one is a what? A doer. One is a wise man and one is a what? Foolish. The imagery is the foundation is either a rock or sand. Now, the rock here not only represented in practice stability, but you see, that was the name of God, the titles of God in the Old Testament. He is the rock. It's stability, but it's also protection. And obviously, the opposite of the rock is the sand, which basically stands for mere sentiment. A sentiment is an emotional desire. Ay, mañana. Tomorrow. No, as David said, today, today. You see, some of you received the Lord. I was here when Victor gave that announcement. You see, you cannot be a disciple. You cannot be a follower of Jesus Christ because uh, this doesn't make sense to you. So Victor invited you. He says, if you want to receive the Lord, and some of you raise your hands in a moment, I'm going to ask you for those who raise your hands and those that perhaps did not, but now you're convinced that your heart needs to be transformed, that your heart has to be regenerated, that you must be born again. All those things are done only through God, the amazing miracle of God. There is no psychiatry. There is no happy feet medicine. There is no institution. There's no drug. There's no elixir. There isn't anything they can allow you to be forgiven of all your sins. Not only forgiven of all your transgressions, but the Bible declares not only to forgive you, but God is willing to forget them. There's no more accusation anymore. And some of you opted to say, yes, just like what I did a long time ago in 1975. I said yes to Jesus Christ. My life has been transformed. But now we got to do one more step. And it's not, that's not to marginalize you, to poke fun at you. You see, we are told in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, we are told that we must believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus rose from the dead publicly. Because if you confess it that publicly, God says, I will confess it before my Father and his angels in heaven. But if you deny me publicly... I too will deny you. So we have to make a public stand. There's something about a public stand. That you have to make that walk. You have to make that stand. You have to be stand up and recognize and say, I want to be a Christian. So before I conclude this, this message, you know, I'm going to make sure that you have that opportunity. Do not allow pride. Do not allow your wife. Do not allow your girlfriend, your husband, your boyfriend. Oh, that thing is next to you. Do not allow that thing to once again hamper you and put a hardship and put an obstacle. It is your life. It is your soul. It is your heart. It is your mind. It is your life. You're the one that's living with the turmoil. And then for once in your life, listen to the voice of God and surrender to him. And let your life begin today anew. You can barf all you want here, <laughs> not physically. But you can bark all you want. It is the vomit of the soul. It's when you throw everything up. You, you purge everything. Spiritually speaking. And at the altar of God is where we make the sacrifice. This is where it's called an altar. We don't sacrifice anymore. It's only one sacrifice already. Only once. Once and for all. Jesus Christ. But here we sacrifice ourselves, Our egos. And finally we sacrifice the madness and the craziness from the past. The past has been a bully to you. The past has been hindering you. And you blame everything on the past. Throw the past away and start new today. Whoever you are. In a moment. I'm telling you that because that way you'll be like me. You'll feel what I feel. You'll be hearing Roberta Flack's song. Dude, you're killing me softly. That's exactly what I want to do with a purpose. For you to be nourished and be poked and pricked. Not by guilt, not by hell, not by damnation. But I want you to be poked and pricked and cued. That God loves you, yes, the way you are. And that God is willing to transform you and change you. Again, you see Jesus, as he talked about these two people... These two people, uh, he was talking about the attitudes and intentions of the heart, the intention of the heart, the external 
actions, not. You see, the condition of our heart determines our influence. Whatever molds you, whatever, whatever influence you have, it will shape your influence. And that influence will determine your destiny. You see, in the heart, we find the true man, the true person. Now, ladies, if I say men, it is the Greek word anthropos, I'm, I'm men, men and women. So I'm not, if I say men, that includes you too. Sometimes I forget, I sniff glue for a long time, and, and <laughs> LSD, mescaline, freon, and so forgive me. I don't have the capacity to remember a lot of things. The character of the evil of the heart, we are told, is desperately, um, is full of malady and disorder. Sin is their disease. Desperate. Someone said it's so wonderful. The evil of the heart is incomprehensible to men. Jeremiah says, and who can know it? One writer said this, and I quote writers because their English is so impeccable that I love the way they express themselves. It hits me right here, man. This is what one writer said. This is the case because we cannot read the hearts of our fellow men, but only judge from external prejudice and self-admiration because there is an intricacy and subtlety about all wickedness which makes it difficult to trace it out. A shamefacedness that seeks concealment, an essential falseness that bellies its own nature, and because the disease has made so a great progress, has penetrated so deeply, ramified so far, and infected every function of the soul so completely that it is beyond all measure, let alone trying to comprehend the evilness that's in our heart. Now the Bible says that it's a contradiction. You see, one of the greatest commandments, the Bible says, is to love God with all our what? That's the first, the first one. All our mind, all our strength, all our soul. But that's the first one. Well, we need to love God with all our heart. But here comes Jeremiah and says, nope, our heart is full of wickedness. There is no remedy. And we think, God, make up your mind. How can we love God with all our heart when our heart is wicked? When Jesus came into history, he says, for out of the mouth, the heart speaks. For out of the abundance of the heart, you find the treachery. You find adultery. You find all the sins as the condition of your heart. We are born sinful. We are born with a nature inherently uh, not to like instruction, not to like correction. We like liberty. We like to be doing our own thing. And then we go on our own thing, not realizing that what we're doing blindly we don't have a GPS, a divine, godly, celestial, biblical GPA. We're lost. Solomon says it a better way. There's a way that seems right to a man, uh, but the end forth brings destruction. Aimlessly, meandering in life, we pursue life. We go through this door. We make a decision, but God is not on our side. And we come to a place in our lives when we reach middle age and you realize, I don't know where I'm going. And I see people like that. They're 40, 45 years old and they're saying, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm half my age. I don't even know where I'm at. I have a house. I have wife. I have children. I have a husband. But there's something missing. I know what that is. It doesn't take us a rocket scientist. You have a hole in the middle of your heart. There's a huge vacuum. There's a hollowness that only Christ can fit in. Only Christ. Disciples, they're together. Imagine, these are disciples changed by God just to be Christians. But imagine getting married to another disciple. They both love God. Jesus said to us, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. That's between brother and sister in the church. How much more when you get the hookup? How much more? You see, your house, when he's speaking here about a house, when he talks about that the floods came and the waters came and the winds came, look at it. Metaphorically, throughout the Bible, floods and waters and rains always speak about some calamities. Jesus was saying basically, listen, whether you're a Christian or not, you're going to go through rain. You're going to go through fire. You're going to go through floods. Those are all metaphors or symbols. 
that we're going to go through life. And I'm telling you now, I'm telling you now, if you're, if, if you're like, if you just hit 40, and listen, buckle up. <laughs> buckle up, buckaroo. I know you're saying, this ain't my first rodeo. Oh, no, these next rodeos after 40, they're big. You better hold on to that bronco. You better hold on because it's going to get wild. And I'm telling you, if your foundation is weak, if your foundation is on sand, you know what happened in San Francisco, the whole world understood this scripture, at least if you're aware of the earthquake that happened in San Francisco. You see, San Francisco had an earthquake, a minor tembler. But something happened in the expensive part of the marina, San Francisco. Houses just went down collapsing. There were fires and people didn't understand why these houses collapsed. And then we came into that lexicon. We understood that word in the lexicon, liquefaction. You ever heard that word, liquefaction? They found out liquefaction. What is liquefaction? And so newscasters and scientists and seismologists and geologists, in order to explain to the common people what is liquefaction, they referred to the scripture of Jesus Christ. They were broadcasting it. Man, Jesus was being glorified. The scientists were saying, well, it's like the Sermon on the Mount. You know, they built the houses in the marina, and they built it upon sand. There was not a true foundation. So just a, a little bit of flood, a little bit of earthquake, caused all those expensive homes to collapse. God was getting all the glory. People understood what the Sermon on the Mount meant. For you and I, if you're a believer, you're a Christian, all you have to do is behave as a Christian. Everything I own, because you see, I've never had a father. I never had an example of what is to love, to care. Everything I, everything I learned, all the inculcation, all the education, all the credentials, everything, I learned it in here. Everything. Everything. Not because I went to East LA College, took Psych 101. Not because of that. Everything I learned here, how to be a father, how to be a husband, how to apologize and take the high road. There's things that Millie did wrong, but I took the blame. <laughs> hey, I'm confessing a feeling to you. I'm telling you the truth. Why? Because I'm, 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 I'm a gentleman? Because I, I'm a good Christian husband? Absolutely not. I came across a book, J. Allen Peterson, The Myth of the Greener Grass, Norman G. Wright. I began to read from others. Then I came across this little book. I went to Thrifties. That's now CBS. It's Thrifties to me. <laughs> Except the ice cream, that's $1.50. It used to be a dime. I went to Thrifties. I've been married for five years. I was in the, in the boxing stage, and I went to the drugstore, and there's a little booklet, like 20 pages, but small little pages, big print. It's like, a, it's like four pages, really, but small. But at the end, it says 12 words, and some of you know these words. I don't want to kick a dead horse, man, but it works. It worked for me. These 12 words that, that guaranteed to preserve your marriage, that's what it says, guaranteed to protect and preserve your marriage. Guaranteed. And I'm thinking, for two fifty, hey, it's better than a divorce lawyer. And it's written very simple. And I read it, and the twelve words were, "I am sorry, I was wrong, it's my fault, I love you." Wow. And I'm thinking, what's so what's so hard about this? Well. It was hard, and it was hard, and it will be hard if you have the inclinations of pride governing you. You see, if pride governs your will, there is no way that you're able to surrender your will and say things like, I'm sorry. There's no way you can accept Jesus Christ because the pride will cloud you and your judgment. So I went, I read that book, and I couldn't wait for the first argument. 
Hey, it didn't happen. It, it happened immediately. And there it is. And we were, she was angry. I was angry. And I, here it comes. It's my fault. What? My fault. I'm sorry. And I put the novella face, you know. I'm so sorry. That soap opera face, you know. My fault. I'm so sorry. I love you. You disarm people. They're ready to fight. They already got everything. And, and I'm sorry. It's my fault. And okay, okay, okay. Walked away. But between you and I and the Holy Spirit and God and all the angels, they knew I wasn't wrong. I was right. I was right. 120%. <laughs> but I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I wanted to experience the promises that Isaiah says. That the rock is like a sanctuary. And yet the very rock is going to crush you. James and Peter quote that scripture. That if we humble ourselves before God, that he will exalt you. Same thing, it says the rock is a rock of offense. Those that come to the rock, he says he will break. But if that rock crushes you, it'll crush you to perdition. Perdition is, is a damnable word. Perdition in the Bible means someone who's damned to hell because you have nothing to do with God. So the very rock that can protect you, bring you shelter, bring you assurance, the same rock. If you don't humble yourself, that rock will crush you and will live in misery. You see, it has that effect. So I wanted to put to the test that if I humble myself and take the blame, absorb the penalty. Just like Jesus, he absorbed the penalty for something he did not do. And I, she was wrong. wrong at least in my head she was wrong I begin to try it I'm sorry and something magical happened I don't know what the Holy Spirit did on the other room but my wife comes out I'm sorry it's my fault <laughs> it was me I know I just don't want to say anything God knows it, you know it, everybody knows it. <laughs> but when we first got married, when we, were, when we were dating, when we were seeing each other, we never had that kind of arguments. What happened? You see, unless the Lord builds the house, there's no house at all. And, 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 and think about those of you that have been married over 10 years, 15, what What happened? Somewhere along the line, we lost our loving feeling. Something happened to us. And we were like that. Remember your wedding day. Your Google eye, you're ready to pay attention to the pastor or the priest. You know, if you come from my background, you don't pay attention. You're just looking at each other. Mm. You're mouthing to the place you're going to go on vacation. Hawaii, Hawaii. <laughs> or Pacoima, Pacoima. <laughs> and you're mouthing that to each other. There, there, there's an enchantment. There's a period of giggleness and googleness and stupidity and wonderment. You know, we're married. Oh, we've only just begun to live. White lace and kiss and we go on our way. Oh. But what happens along the way? You see, as long as we're disciples of Jesus Christ, you see, that is your maximum goal in life. Whether you're single, whether you're married, you're, you're a disciple of Jesus. And if God blesses you with another disciple, a disciple that you can sleep with, Lord have mercy. A disciple that you can have children with, Almighty oh, God have mercy. A disciple that you can have intimate relationships and wake up not guilty. 
And if she's found with child, it's not like we have to hide it. It's a reason to celebrate. You see, friends, disciples are very important. We follow Jesus Christ. But somewhere, somewhere along the line, something goes wrong. What is, what is a hardness of heart? You see, the language of hardness of heart is something to designate an unfeeling state of sensibility. An unfeeling state of sensibility. But that's not really what it means here in, in the Word of God. You see, when hardness of heart is spoken as a sin, the terms designate the committal of the will to a false position, stubbornness in regard to the claims of God, an attitude of disobedience and self-will. In this sense, we often use such language. You see, when your child is stubborn, what do you do? Do you just say, oh, how cute, he's being stubborn. Do you do that? Oh, no, not in my household. All my five kids, they're adults now. They can testify to you that I love them. But when they were young, they thought oh, I was savage. Because I will, the Bible says, spare the rods for the child. I know, and now that's not proper thinking. But that's, that's, that's your bag. <laughs> for me, I mean, I would tell them, hey, this is the grace of God. One. That's the grace of God. One. Quiet. Two. Double grace of God. There's no third. Oh, no. I can take my belt so fast. I mean, in a flash, I would take my belt. That's it. When I had no belt, you know what came out next, right? What do you think? Not, not hard shoes like this. They were softer shoes, but they knew it. Because there was nothing. Oh. <laughs> See, I don't believe in timeouts. Anything, if anything, they would knock them out in a timeout. They're timeout. <laughs> now, I'm not talking about corporal punishment. I'm talking about discipline. And they're adults now. They can all tell you, thank you, Dad. Because it's ministry in their own marriages. It's helping them tremendously. But somewhere along the line, you see, Paul the Apostle said, do not harden your hearts as in the day of rebelling, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. What happened in the wilderness? When you look at Numbers 14, this says they challenged and rebelled God, defiantly, rebelliously against God. And in the rebellion, basically, they lost faith. There was a willful, defiant disobedience against God. The people had, heart, had had a hard heart. Now, how, why, and how did our hearts get so hard? Well, very simple. First, hardness of heart is a result of a series of choices. See, you don't wake up one morning, all of a sudden, you wake up one morning. Wow, what do you feel? I have a hard heart. Shut up. It's a gradual increment, progressive, the decisions that we make. And then you compound out, you compound it with unresolved issues, unmet needs, unfulfilled desires, unfulfilled expectations, and unrealistic expectations. Like, uh, what is a, this is a really unrealistic expectation. If my wife expects me that I am going to have hair, that is unrealistically. <laughs> if she wants me to look like when I was 21 years old, unrealistically. But there are people who go through unfulfilled desires. The unbelief of the promises of God, the refusal to repent results in hardness. And what are the symptoms? Refusing to humble yourself before God. Refusing to obey God's command to love and forgive. Rejecting correction from your spouse or relatives and even close friends. Giving up believing that your marriage could change for the better. Rejecting the testimony of others that God indeed is able to change it. So if you have a heart condition, pun intended, if you have a heart condition, how can my heart, how can my heart heart become tender hearted again? Very simple. I'll leave you with this. i close with this. Number one. Make the choice to come back to God and ask Him for a new heart. 
David, no pun intended, he failed royally. And yet, in this, in this wonderful psalm, penitent psalm there in Psalm 51, he said, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Clean me and give me a new heart and a new spirit. Why? Because I messed up mine. So he asked it. Did he get it? Yes. Make a choice. Number two, make a choice to humble yourself. Hear and respond to his ways. Put God to the test. Because God says, if you humble yourself, that's volitional. When you do it out of your own will, when you do that, God says to you, I will lift you up. I will exalt you. But here's the other side of the coin. But if you lift yourself up in cockiness and hubris and, and, and loftiness and pride and arrogance, God says, I will cut you down. Put him to the test. Humble yourselves. Third, choose to show compassion, mercy, and forgiveness. Fourth, a vertical relationship will always bless the horizontal. You see, if your horizontal relationship is messed up, one thing for sure, your vertical relationship is not what it's supposed to be. You see, any time a vertical relationship, what I mean by vertical relationship, when my relationship with God, when I'm walking with God, I'm in fellowship with God, I'm not transgressing against willfully, rebelliously, when I have this relationship, um, by default, by default, automatically, you see, you ever been to a barbecue party? And there's always that guy that likes to cook. He tells you, I cook a lot. That's what I do. And they all, they're always in the grill. They love doing it. But after everybody's eaten and everything, wherever he walks around, he walks around like a barbecue pit. Because he's been in the fire. He's been in barbecue sauce. He, he, he's just saturated with it. He, he, when he exudes and when he sweats, he sweats barbecue sauce. And it's not that he's full of barbecue sauce. You see, he has been so close with the product that he smelled like barbecue. You see, Paul the Apostle had the same reference. That wherever we go, we ought to have the fragrance of Jesus Christ. Without you telling people you were Christian, without you even broadcasting you're a believer, without you propagating that you are a Christian, People will know you by your actions, by the way you walk, by the way you conduct, by the way you talk, by the way you speak to your wife, your husband, your children. They'll see you. And in this world, it now is very obvious. Try it. Ladies and guys, open the door to your, for your wife. Just open the door for your Just try it for one week, and then you can choose whether to do it again. Just one week. You'll see the transformation when people see it, when your children see it. You see, my children have told, have told us already something that I already knew. The best way to keep my children happy is to love their mother. And they tell me as adults, Dad, every time you hug mom, every time you kiss mom, you are transferring security to us. You see, my friends, it's not because I'm a good guy. I, I, I'm just learning how to be one. A hard heart is not worth it. Allow God to break your heart. It is the same principle of the rock being the foundation. The rock can break you to brokenness. Now, in the world, brokenness, it speaks of defeat. Uh, someone who cannot keep up. Someone who is deficient in the world. You look like a weakling. But we don't follow the world. The Bible says that when God breaks us, he loves that. When we have a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Why? Because when we have a broken heart, there's only one person that's able not only to mend it and to fix it up, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Today you may have a hard heart. Before you start your car in the parking, I don't want to put you right now to the test, but before, when you get in your car, Put it on because it's hot. Put the air conditioner if you have air conditioning. Not open the windows and just do the East LA thing and let the air come in. <laughs> and turn to your wife or your husband. Three, twelve words. The last three, I love you. You can't forget that one. But I'm sorry. I was wrong. It's my fault. Now, you know and I know it's not your fault. 
but try it. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Now, for those of you that raise your hands to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you, I didn't open my eyes. I had my eyes closed. My wife and I were praying. For those of you that raised your hand, and some of you did. Some of you did not. This would be a good time for you to do something you thought you would never do. And that is turn your will to God. Allow him to forgive you, to cleanse you, to give you a hygienic cardiac cleansing. Hygienic cardiac cleansing. Where do I go for that? There's nowhere. Not even CVS or Thrifties can do that. <laughs> Only the blood of Jesus Christ. And listen, there's an added plus to that. Your conscience can be purged. Oh, there's an added conscience to that too. And then God enters your life. Oh, we're not done yet. He'll give you love, hope, faith. Not only that, but he'll give you, he'll take away all your messed up ideas. And he will give you his own. And all of a sudden, your wife's going to look righteous, man. Your husband, though as ugly as he is, God will bless you. Whoa, you will look at your husband. See, it's the same guy. It is you that have been transforming change.